It's much more common historically and for humans to say, here's something new under the sun and oh my God, what am I going to do about it? That's a very different kind of response. Dr. Fidel, please tell us about your book, the title of which is A Culture of Improvement, Technology and the Western Millennium. Um, the book was a result of the fact that I uh, have been teaching a survey of the history of technology in Europe and America uh, for several decades. Uh, and uh, after a while, I realized that one of the things I did in the courses was uh, constantly complain to the students about the books that I was giving them to read. <laughs> So, so you were giving them several I, books to read, right? Oh yes, yes. There was no, there was no really good textbook uh, uh, at the time, and so I finally, basically, said I should put up or shut up. Uh, I suppose, <laughs> <laughs> which which had interesting complicated interesting uh, uh, consequences uh, for my teaching later, but uh, we can get to that. Uh, but in any case, in in the course of of teaching the history of technology, I had come around to starting my uh, discussion uh, in the European Middle Ages. And I should hasten to say, uh, I was, uh, because this was my training, this was my strength, and also because I thought it was intellectually defensible, I focused on Europe and North America uh, to uh, not the total, but almost total exclusion of the rest of the world. Uh, for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I can defend that choice if I need to. But um, I decided that uh, it would be useful to try to sit down and organize my thinking about the technology over the last 1,000 years and to see if there were some themes that I could tease out from that large themes. story. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay. Uh, themes are a good thing, I think. Yeah. Uh, if, you can, if you can find them. Uh, so uh, uh, it took me a, a good while to uh, of just simply surely uh, thinking through uh, what made the story of technology in the West hang together. Uh, and I remember uh, how kind of uh, abashed I was when I said, well, there is this pattern of improvement that is going on. And I said, well, boy, that sure sounds simple-minded. Uh, but then I thought a little bit more about what I meant by technological improvement and what people in the past had meant by technological improvement. And I realized that there was something more subtle going on that I thought people had missed. And it's this, that we, we human beings, I think, and this is a and a premise, okay, that I that I make. Uh, we human beings have, in fact, a capacity, even a proclivity, for thinking of, that we can do things better. That uh, uh, you see this in children, especially. Okay, you know they're constantly experimenting. I want to see if <laughs> how can I build my pile of blocks higher? Uh, uh, how can I, you know, uh, tease my little sister uh, more effectively uh, <laughs> I love that. what whatever it is uh, uh, and then I realized well you know there's a degree to which all of us do this uh, I like cooking for example so I get into the kitchen and I'm trying to make something and I say well what if I put a bit more basil in this spaghetti sauce or or maybe throw some capers in there now that's kind of radical but I sounds good to me to well, exactly, but not to everybody, I, I tell you, from experience. Right? <laughs> In any case, you, you, uh, you're you experimenting, and you're trying to, to tweak things, to improve things. And, and, I, and I had this sense, I hesitate to call it an insight, but it was what I perceived, which was that much of technology is, in fact, to be seen as not 
a matter of great invention. And believe me, I love great inventions. I write about them. But yeah. much of technology is, in fact, to be seen in terms of the small improvement, the incremental improvements. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, I, and my premise was that, that human beings, all human beings, from the beginning of, of, of what we would call uh, reasonably large-brained uh, hominids, uh, uh, do this. They experiment. They they. They tweak things. They try to improve things. But then I, I, I had another thought. But, but something obviously happened to change the way that we do that, that we improve things, that we make technologies. Something changed over some time in the last 500 years or 1,000 years, for that matter. But something. And that's when I began to think that well, what changed is that we came up, at least in Europe, and then in the European influenced parts of North America, we came up with the means of uh, taking those improvements, which are typically quite ephemeral, uh, and making them less ephemeral. The term I came up with, for lack of any better one, would capture so there would could you give an example of that uh yes, improvement? yes absolutely absolutely yeah. uh, uh one of the reasons that i talk about technology in the west from 1000 onward is that about the year 1000 you know the 11th 12th 13th century we finally begin to get writings where people are actually describing things. They're putting down recipes. Which goes I back to I, Gutenberg that you were talking about. Right. But even before Gutenberg, I'm beginning to write it down. The monks are telling me how, in fact, I dye cloth, for example, or, oh, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that kind of stuff. So I'm beginning to, to get a bit of that. And, and I'm also even beginning to get a bit of celebration. Uh, of uh, uh, by the fourteenth and by the fourteenth century, just before printing, we're beginning to get people talk about, uh, for example, the the first uh, the first monk who who describes uh, uh, spectacles and eyeglasses. The fact that we can, uh, I, I've just I've just got news that that this guy uh, uh, over uh, in the next city over, uh, it taking these lenses and he's putting them in front of eyes. And, and people can see better. Oh, wow, isn't that crazy? Uh, he writes. Oh, wow. Uh, and, that, and, that, and that find, that invention, that discovery doesn't fade into history because right. someone has written it down and, right, and, right, and right. now there are records of... But it's not just that the invention doesn't fade. I, you know, I'm reasonably convinced that spectacle would have would have stuck around. They're pretty handy and, and people like them. But what what what's important to me is that somebody is celebrating it because we we don't get that kind of celebration before. We don't get this 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 somebody actually saying, Wow, here's something new under the sun and isn't it wonderful? It's much more common historically and for humans to say Here's something new under the sun, and oh my God, what am I going to do about it? That's a very different kind of response. Uh, but now, when we begin oh. to get to the point where we're celebrating it, that's that's quite different. And I wanted to I wanted to understand that process by which we created what I call the culture of improvement, a a a, a broad set of cultural values that actually promotes improvement it makes it easier it makes it more uh, uh acceptable uh but previous previously uh in in the pre-modern periods if i change something i have i am challenged to say why and who's going to be hurt by it okay uh the assumption that if I change things and it's actually going to be good for most people, maybe not everybody, but for most people, that is a new assumption historically. And it's one of the reasons why the Europeans, I think, begin to be a very exceptional culture from the high Middle Ages onward 
is because they begin to accept and to actually seek out changes in the ways in which they do things, as opposed to challenging them. Um, there, uh, as you're talking about this theme that is really fascinating, I had not thought about the shift in perception uh, towards new, um, not just technology, just new ways, improvements. It doesn't necessarily have to be technological, just could right. be n- new methods of doing something. Um, one of the things that I thought of, and I don't know if this is something that you picked up, if we fast forward in history, let's say now we're um, somewhere in the late 1600s, uh, early 1700s, does money play a part in uh, in acceleration of improvements? And, and what I mean by that is this, uh, Patents come out, like, you know, they started in Venice and they traveled, they went to London and then uh, France and then to the U.S. And not just from, I'm not interested in the sort of a legal perspective, is that those that came up with new ways and, and inventions saw an opportunity to also make money out of that to to better their lots in life. So it wasn't just that you invented something and you know it went to the king or queen now you could actually become part of sort of the you know the the the, the entrepreneurial class that wasn't really thriving many 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 centuries past is that assessment uh relevant to to the i guess the yeah yeah, uh, uh, although i have to confess my my attention draw is not be drawn not to the money, but to the accounting. The accounting. Uh, in other, the accounting. In other words, how do we know how rich we are? Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's something that changes. We see that changing in the Renaissance. Uh, we begin to think about double entry bookkeeping, for example. How do I know how much I owe as opposed to how much I actually have coming in and how much I actually own, possess myself? It's that ability to think in new and creative ways about the money itself. Uh, about uh, That's why I say accounting. It's about how do I know how much I have? how much I have coming in, where it's coming from, who's it coming from, that sort of thing. So it that, I think, is is a really interesting innovation that goes along parallel to the technological uh, changes uh, of uh, uh, of the uh, from the 14th and on into the 16th and 17th century. It's my ability to think about about money in in creative and even abstract ways. Think about that, the fact that I can abstract the whole notion of how wealthy I am. I don't have to sit on a pile of gold. I can have, I mean, credit, for example. Credit is all about the abstraction of money and of keeping track of it. You don't need to physically possess it. It, it, it can. It, right. That's really interesting. Right. Um, uh, let's take a break here. Stay with me and Dr. Friedel as we get into the perspective. Um, 